Good morning. Um, yeah, talk about policy right before lunch. Um, it's going to be the height of excitement. Um, and actually, uh, how I came to be doing this was I was talking to, we had a co conference call helping plan this. And Will Francis called me afterwards, and he wanted some feedback about things. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to skip that policy thing. You know, I just don't really see, you know, anything great happening policy-wise. Um, and that turned into, you're going to moderate the panel. <laughs> um, so it's always my, uh, my caution. Be careful what you say to Will, because uh, <laughs> you'll be roped in. Um, but I'm not going to introduce the panelists. I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, and we are talking about four particular policies. Um, and so we've, we're just going to go right down the line and talk about each one of these. Um, and so they're going to have about 10 minutes. And I'll, it may be at the start of their, um, uh, they can introduce themselves very briefly and then talk about the, the policy. Um, but then before we get into this too far. I wanted to explain my cynicism. You know, why, why did I have that rea reaction when Will called me? And probably, like a lot of you, we always hear about these things happening. And it could be certainly our political climate these days is dysfunctional. And you know, who knows what's actually going to happen. And we've had tons of policies that have happened over the years. But we still have rampant unemployment for folks with intellectual disabilities and really uh, tough issues with full inclusion. So. That's one of the questions that I asked the panel. So what's different about these policies? Um, and I decided to take the higher road and you know, try to get beyond my cynicism and think about what is the bigger positive, positive picture about what's happening with policy. Um, which led me to this, um, but kind of as a, an aside, uh, where I work at UCLA, we have a new dean, and he's bringing in this whole team of uh, strategic planner type people. And they introduced this concept to me, which kind of blew my mind a little bit. It seems so simple. But you know, it's kind of this radical incrementalism. You know, so it, when you work in the public sector, when you work for large bureaucracies, it's really hard to change things quickly. Um, so we have to be fairly deliberate, you know, taking a small step, moving forward ever so slowly, until we get to that big, profound change. And certainly in my lifetime, we've seen that with um, the IDEA, you know, uh, the Rehab Act, um, ADA, the Higher Education Opportunity Act, re, um, and the Lanterman Act here in California. So there's a lot of things that will lead up to this big, profound change. And so that was what led me to asking these four questions. Um, and I sent these to the panelists beforehand, so I hope that they will uh, uh, address them in some way. You know, so tell us first, why is this an important policy? What impact will this have on real people? I mean, real impact on real people, I think, is really important. How does it lead to the next step, the next profound change? And then, what is indeed the next step? So without further ado, I'm going to leave these questions up here. And periodically, I have Wi-Fi access. So little notes might pop up saying that I've got a meeting with somebody. Um, so, <laughs> but these are the four questions. So without further ado, I'll just turn it over to Mark Pollitt and uh, have him introduce himself and talk about the employment first policy. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, I'm going to spend some sleepless nights wondering if I'm a radical incrementalist. <laughs> so. Uh, so my name's Mark Pollitt. I'm the Deputy Director of Policy and Planning at the State Council on Developmental Disabilities. And I'm also a parent of a young man uh, who's a client of the Regional Center System with some very significant disabilities. And my first introduction to the concept of employment was when my son was in high school in a special day class uh, on his way to no place in particular, uh, thinking about, OK, He's going to be graduating out of the school system in a few years. How can I, you know, what chance does he have to be really a part of his community? And it was pretty obvious to me. My son needs a job at a regular work site. And I don't have to explain more about that. I mean, we have that in our own experience at work sites. And there's not much I can add to the panel that uh, just spoke. Uh, earlier today, 
So I went about researching that, and quite frankly, I didn't find a lot of opportunities for my son, and the regional center case manager didn't. So he's uh, been spending his years in a day program, uh, which gets out and about a lot, but he's really a tourist in his own community, and fortunately has family and people in his neighborhood that do know him. Uh, but he didn't have that opportunity to really contribute and be a part of his community. Uh, so the importance of the employment first policy is that it sets a direction. And I'll quote it again. Uh, thank you to Larry for quoting it earlier. But it is the policy of the state that opportunities for integrated competitive employment shall be given the highest priority for working age individuals with developmental disabilities, regardless of the severity of their disabilities. And it's wonderful that in the legislative process, that last phrase was added, regardless of the severity of their disabilities, because it's clear this is not a priority of the state just for some people who maybe can work, maybe, but it's a priority uh, for everyone. And the Lantham Act contains certain values, and it's contained them for a long time. Uh, to make services and supports available to enable persons with developmental disabilities to approximate the pattern of everyday living available to people without disabilities of the same age, to support the integration of persons with developmental disabilities into the mainstream life of the community and to bring about more independent, productive, and normal lives. Well, for somebody of working age, this sounds a lot like having a job. And the key importance of the Employment First policy uh, that was signed into law October 9th is that it establishes very firmly as a value within the Lantman Act the value of work, of integrated work at a competitive wage. The policy actually doesn't do a lot. It doesn't make people do very much. It tells regional centers to make information on the policy available to people. And it tells the IPP teams that the, this is the first consideration uh, during an IPP process for uh, youth in transition or for working age individuals. But it doesn't force people to do a lot. But it does set out a clear priority. It's a change in direction for uh, the regional center system. And as more families find out about this, and as, as more regional center clients find out about this, there'll be a growing demand. And this demand will hit the schools, and it will hit the colleges. Because people will have greater expectations that they indeed can work or that their children indeed can work. So now we want to double down on something that came out from the panelists. Uh, our panelists this morning were very happy to be making money. And this is no, no small thing, because one of the tremendous stressors of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and one of the great limitations they face is that most people live in poverty. And whether you have a disability or not, poverty has tre gives you tremendous limitations in, in what kind of meaningful life you can lead, how you can integrate into your community, how you can go out on a date or see a movie or buy clothes that you want or get around. And so the ability to actually make money uh, is very, very important to developing a greater quality of life. What the Employment First policy does, it creates a statutory foundation to help the system change direction. Again, it's the highest priority to make these opportunities available to people. And what it does is it gives people like us uh, more tools or a greater moral authority within the system to move this agenda forward. So it really is a foundation upon which our work can rest. 
uh, there was a time when it was in the legislature when it looked like the policy would fail and we had to start to reassess how important this policy was and I think we realized very quickly that without this policy our work to move the employment agenda forward would become much more difficult and when it passed it gave this feeling that now we have the signature of the governor and the will of the legislature behind us when we try to work with the people we work with you know, ev every day, including the legislature, we have this moral authority. We have something that was considered over six years by the legislature and finally adopted. And, and actually, it's a good thing it took so long in some ways because it became a consensus position within the developmental disability stakeholder community. We had time to work through a lot of the resistance to this and uh, co-sponsors of the legislation were the trade, you know, California Disability Services Association and the ARC of California, both of whom have a lot members uh, whose primary business is day programs, uh, sheltered workshop, group supported employment and a smattering, smattering of integrated uh, supported employment. So it, it is a consensus position and now the challenge is to move it. The challenge is to move the agenda, strike while the iron is hot and there is you know, a tremendous amount of work to be done. The council is co-sponsoring legislation this year to create a service, service code uh, for regional center services which is for employment preparation sort of pre-vocational work which is very which is very impl important it would actually help fund employment preparation and discovery for people and fi fill a real gap and so but this is just one item there's just much more work to be done uh, but the importance of the policy is it gives us the moral authority and the attention of the state and the acknowledgement of the stakeholder community and the legislature that this is where California has to do to make really meaningful lives for people, productive lives where people contribute, where people make money to increase their quality of life, to make all this available to people. Thank you. Yes, please go right ahead, Greg and okay. Denise. Thank you and good morning. Well, I, I had the opportunity to share a little bit my, about myself earlier, so I'll just add a couple of things briefly if I could. Um, and that is in my um, prior to to working um, in my current role at the School of Continuing Education in North Orange. Uh, I also had uh, some great experience working at Long Beach City College, and there I got to work with uh, career. I'm, I'm sorry, transition from high school to college. Um, I, I served as a dean of Trades, Industrial, and Career Technologies, or Career Technical Education programs at the college. And I really enjoyed that work. And then prior to my life, even as an educator, I have a finance or accounting background. And so um, th those are really some of the, the skills that you get in that field are, are really good skills, I think. They, they help you go to work. And they, they helped me not only earn money, like we were talking about earlier, but also gave me an opportunity while I was doing that work to gain access to something that is now my passion. So while working as a finance or an accounting person at a college, I looked around and said, wow, this is the best accounting job I've ever had. Uh, I, and so um, th to me, that, that personally, that's so important what we're talking about today because it's j just opening those few doors to tap into um, our students and find out what is their passion and then giving them support to pursue their passion. One other thing, I, our students were terrific. Um, all of them, and when I heard the comments from our colleagues, our scholars at UCLA and, and the football, the student section, I'm really glad I chose today to not wear my USC tie. I think I would be harmed, <laughs> right? So thank you, thank you. Um, go Bruins. Okay, okay. Uh, Denise and I um, are gonna, thank you for the invitation to talk a little bit today about the Student Success Act, and so this first part, I think I'll briefly just touch on why it's important and what issue does it address. 
Uh, so from, let me just share that the Student Success Act really came about through Senate Bill 1456. It's also known as the Student Success Act of 2012. And essentially what this legislation did was create a very intentional focus on some services that our community colleges and, and even in higher ed are, are pretty common. Things like assessment, uh, orientation services, counseling, um, educational plan development. So these, these are certainly core support services aimed at uh, helping students. So what's different about it is this law made it very, very intentional. Um, and, and it's based on the fact that um, the belief that by really uh, strengthening the attention to these types of services, even making it mando mandatory based on a new model of funding, that students as a result will get more um, direct access to these services. And as a result, um, the rates of student success will increase. Um, not only the numbers of students who are successful, but the rate at which they're successful. I think the belief and the hope is that it will accelerate. So we'll come back to that. Denise? My name is Denise Simpson, and I'm the DSPS director for the School of Continuing Education. And I'll just tell a little bit about my background. I started off as a, an instructional assistant in the classroom, then became an instructor, and then went into management. And I'm just grateful to be in a district that is so supportive of all that we do. And, and of course, I'm sitting here next to my boss, and that's not why I'm saying it. But he's um, Greg has been wonderful um, ever since you know he had been at our in our district um, when he was our finance person. He came in and helped you know get um, get more. Um, access to funding for our students and even within our own district we've got a board of directors that is so supportive of inclusive education for all students that it's the community so we have an array of offerings for all different students you know older adults kids parents everything um, and of course our students with disabilities fall under that um, so what we decided as a strategy strategy is that Greg will kind of talk the overview and then I'll kind of um, kind of emphasize where it affects our program, our students. And so as far as you know, the assessments, the orientation, many of these things we already do in DSPS. Um, we've always had orientations. We're now going to like fine tune them and make sure that we're able to report them. Um, in our program, we've always had educational plans. Um, DSPS is required to show, man, um, show that students are making progress. And so, although when this first came out, we were a little afraid, and we did have to advocate to make sure that students with intellectual disabilities weren't left out, um, we're used to that, though. We're always advocating for our students, and we're always making sure that they're included when changes come about. Um, but as far as you know, doing these things, assessment is always maybe the biggest challenge, because if they say everybody has to have a, a particular assessment, or they can't be placed into you know, certain classes, it could look like they can be excluded. Um, but we'll, we'll find ways around that as we do. The career technical education offerings are always a great option. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about those and over some of the other questions. But um, I think the one thing that um, community college, this new direction they're trying to go is that everything's on achievement. And so we just need to make sure that, that everybody still views student success as just the acquiring of skills and, and moving on to their own goal, as opposed to only obtain, obtaining a certificate or an AA degree. And we're in position to do that, so I'm not fearful. Hi, I'm Mike Clark. I'm, I have no idea why I'm here other than Will twisted my arm. <laughs> but uh, I've ha I have over 45 years experience in uh, teaching college classes at a variety of different places around the country. I'm a reformed regional center director and I have a 31-year-old uh, daughter who has Down syndrome and uh, actually is uh, uh, working sometimes. So that's kind of a variety of things. Plus I ran a plumbing shop for 10 years so you put all that together and you know that, that's, a, that's a nice background for this kind of work. This past year, the California legislature passed and the governor signed Senate Bill 468. This bill 
and the ensuing law brought into existence a requirement for the Department of Developmental Services through the 21 regional centers in California to offer um, self-determination as a viable model, as a viable way for people to uh, uh, get uh, developmental services funded uh, through a regional center, but where the consumer is really in the driver's seat. You know, my first word of advice for any of you, if you're ever going to pursue something legislatively, have the wisdom and the good luck to get an author who, once he's agreed to carry the bill, you find out really has a passion for what you're trying to do, makes life a whole lot better and uh, helps things to move forward. That uh, Eric talked about, uh, what, what's the term, rab not, not rabid, uh, radical. Radical, radical incrementalism. Radical incrementalism. Well, Mark, you know, was whining a little bit about the six years that it took to get employment first legislation passed the legislature. In 1998, so that's 16 years ago, just in case you're not really skilled in mathematics, <laughs> the state of California went down the path and adopted a, a policy, at least that was executively determined, that we were going to have some self-determination pilots within the developmental disability system. And uh, a number of, re three regional centers were chosen, got a little extra, extra money, and two of us piled on and went along with them. So five regional centers developed pilot programs. The idea was that after piloting these programs for three years, we would then have self-determination that would become opened up as a legitimate vehicle for people receiving services through regional centers anywhere in the state. Well, come 2001, we went on to 2002, and we went on to 2003, and uh, you know the the state actually legitimately made a couple of efforts to move forward with self determination, but they didn't go very far. So in uh, September of 2012, there were six of us, all relatives of people with intellectual disabilities. We got together at uh, in the whatever the name of the restaurant there is in Marriott Hotel across from the Burbank Airport. And uh, we just kind of decided, as a group of six people who were powerless and who really didn't have any extra money to throw at anything, we decided, let's go after self-determination. Now's the time that maybe we can push this through the state. And we had lots of people tell us we were crazy, that we were out of our minds, that we didn't, pardon my French, but we didn't have a snowball's chance in hell of uh, being able to uh, get this through, that it was premature, that lots of other things would happen. We thought, how can something be premature if it's 14 years behind? <laughs> and we went forward. And every time we were gonna have a hearing in the legislature, we were told that, uh, uh, you know, be prepared, you guys are gonna die. Well, we got through our Senate Human Services hearing and we got through our Senate budget hearing without getting a negative vote. Everybody supported it. We passed the Senate without any negative votes. So then the message was very strong, you're gonna be killed in the assembly. So we got through the Assembly Human Services Committee with no negative votes. And so then we go to the Assembly Budget Committee and we were told you're really gonna get killed in the Assembly Budget Committee. Well, we got in the Assembly Budget Committee and just my own personal assembly member is Shannon Grove. If that doesn't get a reaction from the audience, I'm in a safe neighborhood. Um, <laughs> Shannon is not known for her uh, compassion and uh, uh, incrementalism, whether it's radical or <laughs> otherwise. And Shannon had every intention of wanting to kill this bill. But through the process of actually going, this was a hearing where it was more than just theater. Uh, through the process of going through this hearing, Shannon not only changed and decided to support the, 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 the thing, she made a an amendment to the uh, motion to pass the bill and put a little more money into it. And this is, you know, a really conservative woman. And, and I, I, I think that was wonderful. That was a very nice thing. Anyway, we made it through that committee with no negative votes. We made it through the assembly with no negative votes. And so then the message was, governor ain't gonna sign it. No way. Well, the governor signed it. So now we have a self-determination bill. The self-determination bill actually has a lot in common with the Employment First bill. It, 
It's a structure. It's an intention. It's a skeleton. But the meat has to be put upon the skeleton. So I've now answered you know, a couple of Eric's questions, but I'll do that more directly. Why is this policy important? I know, and I think many of you would share this belief, that if people are making their own decisions about what they're going to do in their own life, they tend to be more committed to carrying out and succeeding in whatever it's going to take. I, I think that our panel earlier this morning illustrated that point. I didn't hear any reluctance on any of your parts to go to work. I heard strong enthusiasm and support for going to work and getting a paycheck. And we think that self-determination is going to support and promote that sort of behavior, especially with my buddy Larry here. Uh, <laughs> what impact will this have on real people? Well, Senator Emerson came to the notion and was told this and decided he really wanted to wear this mantle. He has since uh, resigned from the state senate, which is too bad. But uh, he, this potentially and has been said to be the most significant piece of legislation that has been passed in the development service, developmental services arena since the original passage of the Lanterman Act. So that's kind of opening the door for some real impact that, you know, it may impact a lot of people, it may impact a few people. We don't know yet. The marketplace is gonna have to be, ultimately lead us to that decision. How does it lead to more profound change? Well. If all of a sudden you have an individual budget, and if you have control over how that budget is going to spent, be spent, now it can't be willy-nilly, it has to be planful, it has to be part of a person-centered planning process, it has to be part of a person-centered plan, there has to be certain approvals that take place in terms of the overall budget, but then you have a lot of freedom, you're not stuck with a myriad of regulations and vendor regulations and things like that in terms of prohibiting what you can use different monies for. You can't do anything illegal. Well, that makes sense to me. It's tax, taxpayers' dollars. You've got to you know, kind of follow the law in what you're doing. But if it's really contributing to successful outcomes in your plan, you're going to have a real, you know, that's what's going to happen. That's, that, that's the impact that it's going to have or apt to have on real people doing real things. And as that happens, as we see, you know, we, we think we're walking hand in hand with the employment first interest and in, in legislation that as more people go to work, it's going to become progressively easier for still more people to go to work. I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think in the state of Washington, like 82% uh, of folks of the right age range with intellectual and developmental disabilities are in fact working out in the community as compared to 6.5% of the people in California. So I think as we can open the door, we can help people in California move forward to close that gap. As we close that working gap, I think we'll also make great progress. Most of the people I know with intellectual disabilities as, as adults, particularly people that aren't living with their families, they're pretty much living a life of poverty. They don't have a lot of options open to them. And I think we can change that. So I, I think that they're really is the opportunity to use this legislation to catapult us into profound change. And what is the next step? The next step is, is very simply, it, it's going to be four years before you see very much of this. Okay, The law is passed. It's in statute for the state of California. But this year, the Department of Developmental Services has to do a number of things that will align what are called Medicaid waivers, federal waivers, with the notion of self-determination. Now, the feds are very supportive of the idea. The uh, Center for Medicaid uh, uh, Services is very supportive of the idea of self-determination. They've been pushing it for a number of years, and they wondered, you know, how come more states haven't really wanted to jump on this bandwagon and do more? And uh, so, you know, I think that they're going to take the news that California now actually has it legislatively as opposed to just done by administrative fiat, I, I think that that's going to be a good thing and I think that that's going to be very helpful to us. But it takes time to get those sorts of things in place and then 1,500 people over the next three years once the waivers are put in place can actually, uh, excuse me, not 1,500, 2,500 people can participate in self-determination and at the end of three years then 
supposedly we'll know enough about what we're doing and we'll have an infrastructure built and the doors will open and anybody who is interested can participate. Thank you. So we'll just have Larry and Stormy uh, talk about the uh, uh, Taylor Day program and then we'll have a few minutes for questions. So start formulating questions for after that. Thank you, Mike. Mike's a little modest. Uh, he was doing some of this stuff. He's a pioneer. Taft College was doing some of the things that Absolutely. we're doing today and working hard at, but clearly blazed a trail. So thank you, Dr. Clark, for some of the great stuff you did many, many years ago. Now, yeah. now Taylor Day Services. Stormy's going to give you all the great details. I'm, as an executive director, <laughs> Janice and, Janice and I get to sit down with Denise and, and uh, many day programs and many colleges and high schools, uh, districts and SELPAs and talk about the plans of how we're going to do things, what we want to do, because it, we're at, as, at the executive director level, it's really about all the options. As I said earlier, work, there's nothing more important, so having all the options in place so that it can meet every single individual that we serve. That's, that's the goal. And Taylor Day Services is another option, another tool that, to my right here, Stormy has done better than any of the 21 regional centers in the state. She at San Diego has surpassed everybody in this area. So I absolutely want to get the mic to the person that's a pro at this. OK, thank you. Thank you, Larry. I really appreciate those kind words. Um, I think I, it, you find with the um, all of our regional centers, we're doing such great work, and then we get wind of what another regional center is doing. It's like, ah, oh, you know, that's brilliant. So um, while I may know a lot about Taylor Day Services, I certainly am um, really happy to spend today with Larry um, because Regional Center of Orange County is doing some phenomenal work in the areas of employment um, and, and beyond. So um, I want to give you a little bit of uh, just my background and my involvement with the consortium. I think it was in 2009 or 2010, um, I saw a flyer much like the one that went out a couple of months ago regarding um, this uh, meeting. And I said, oh, this sounds great. You know, uh, at that time at uh, SDRC, San Diego Regional Center, my role um, was primarily supported employment services and supporting the vendors um, that were doing a lot of work in our area and in the area of employment. Um, so post-secondary education and providing supports in that area was um, uh, something really um, just unknown to me. And I, I can honestly say for SDRC, um, not an area that we really um, were uh, much exposed to. So then I come to this uh, consortium meeting and I'm just amazed at all of the things that are going on throughout the uh, state of California, the great work that some have been doing for years. Um, and I had this aha moment um, thinking about employment and um, Olivia mentioned earlier this um, using uh, higher education as a path to employment. It just made sense um, thinking about my own personal experience and what college did for me. The supports I received in college led to uh, graduate assistantship and opportunities to um, have uh, leadership positions and, and be where I am today. Um, so for me, that aha was if it meant so much to me and my life, and still I have the, those strong relationships with my mentors in college, why wouldn't it make sense for the people that we serve? And so there were a couple of us that, um, it was myself and some others from San Diego that were at that meeting, and it just lit a fire in us. So we came back to San Diego and said, we, we have regional center, we have a much larger role in this support. It is not the, just the responsibility of disability services on campus um, or the, the just the, the, the natural supports from your family and siblings that are offered um, to students as they're trying to uh, make their way through college. It really is a responsibility of all of us if, at the IPP meeting. Why are we not really um, promoting education and saying here's what we can bring to the table in terms of support. So that was what 2009-2010 um, and then right around um, it was 2011 I think around March um, we were given um, what I consider to be somewhat of a gift um, through the California budget process. How about that? <laughs> 
which was uh, Taylor Day Services. And um, like Eric mentioned, uh, cynicism. And I think that um, for some of us, you know, we see, okay, here's Taylor Day Services. Um, it was designed through the California budget process, and it's a cost savings measure. Some it, Usually that's not going to lead to some major innovation. And I can be honest in saying that. We've seen some other areas where it's just like, we don't know how to make this happen. Um, but as I started to look through, um, really read um, Taylor Day Services, and you can find it in Welfare and Institutions Code 4688.21 in WIC, and really read it, it's like, oh, I think we can make this happen. So what we started to do in our employment task force meetings and um, in our um, various roundtables we have in San Diego, we started to have the conversation of Taylor Day with our service providers and not only say, here it is, and you know if you want to do something with it, you can. It was like, here's how you can do it. And we really spent a great amount of time um, in coming up with um, how, uh, rates and um, the the structure of it um, and it was I think it was through that support from regional center that service providers in San Diego really um, grabbed onto the concept and and ran with it so let me tell you a little bit about what Taylor day services is um, I mentioned it was a cost savings measure that came about in 2011 and that um, Particular, this particular service, it's a, a custom, customized service. Um, it's, a, it's individualized to support a person in the areas of um, vocational skills uh, development, uh, job retention, in the area of post-secondary education, in the areas of like self-employment as well, and community integration, capacity building. So certainly my head was running with, you know, that post-secondary education piece. It's like, ah, this is a mechanism for us um, to um, be able to offer more support in the area of post-secondary at community colleges and uh, colleges and universities throughout San Diego, and we also serve Imperial counties. Um, so in December of 2011, it was um, our first service provider who came on board uh, to support a person in self-employment. And then from there, when, and where we are today, we have 11 serv service providers on board who are supporting um, close to 300 people in San Diego who are attending college. So what are they, how are they supporting people? They're helping them uh, to identify courses that are going to lead to the career path that um, they want to be on. They're um, uh, helping them to successfully complete these courses, um, to reach degree completion, um, to become a part of the campus community, um, to develop those relationships. A lot of the work in that area of post-secondary ed using Taylor Day Services is done on campus. Um, so it really is, we have some service providers that solely focus on, I, dress, I mentioned all of those areas of employment and community integration and post-secondary education, but we do have some providers that exclusively focus on post-secondary ed because they wanted to pick an area and they wanted to do it right and they saw the need in our community um, to support people in post-secondary ed. So I, I um, I'm extremely excited about um, the growth that we've had in San Diego, um, the number of people that we now are seeing that have greater access uh, to uh, community colleges and universities. Our relationships, um, and I think later we'll be talking about uh, collaboration and um, our work break, breakout session in the afternoon, but I think that's been one of the most phenomenal things in San Diego to see um, our relationships strengthen with the community colleges and universities. We sit down um, and, and have discussions about um, other types of opportunities beyond Taylor Day. How can we work better uh, together to support individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities? So uh, they're becoming more familiar with San Diego Regional Center and our system, and um, it's really just been a, a great gift. Um, it's another option where what we're seeing, um, primarily with transition age youth, taking advantage of this Taylor Day service at San Diego Regional Center, between the ages of 16 and 22, we serve about 3,000 people. So it's, it, it really is wonderful to know that um, our work is not done, but there is another op option available to people who really do see college um, as a possibility for them and know that that's going to be their path to employment.
you guys are phenomenal. Every one of you kept to the time limit. I didn't have to say anything. Um, and I. <laughs> And just said a whole heck of a lot in those uh, few minutes that you had. And uh, through no authority, I would dub you all radical incrementalists. <laughs> uh, and you can put a little RI after your name, you know. After, so, Thank you very so we'll see that. Um, I did want to say just a couple things, and we'll have a, a couple minutes for questions. Um, you know, certainly it takes people that work in these big bureaucracies that to make things happen. People that are dedicated. Um, I think Mark uh, mentioned that, you know, that there has to be, there have to be people that move things forward. And I know that just in this room, we have people that work in all sorts of different uh, blo uh, blobs, big lumps of bureaucracy um, that move things forward. So I'm sure we have folks from uh, regional centers here. You raise your hand if you work for a regional center. Awesome. Department of Rehab, I know at least one. There's at least one Department of Rehab. Oh, there's a whole bunch of you. Good. K-12 schools. Awesome. Colleges, universities. And let's not forget parents who actually have made most of the things, most of the good things that have happened in this field uh, happen. So... With, uh, with that, I will open it up for questions. If anybody has for the panel, we've got about six minutes before lunch. So <laughs> That was fast. Okay, I have a question for Denise, I think it is. Denise, where are you? Yes, I see you. Hi, so what would you say would be the best way to approach um, your, your office, the DSPS office, to have you, or this wouldn't be you, it would be someone else, understand that my kid is your kid, our kids are your kids. Because when we approached our university um, on many fronts, it was those kids aren't our kids. We don't serve those kids. So what would be the best way to have you understand that concept? Um, that's a good question. I think in our area, what we do a lot of is um, the, lang the language. You know, I maybe work with uh, the CTE program. It's an automotive um, class, so we're actually talking maybe with the other administrators. And they often, often want to say, oh, the DSPS student. I said, well, no, they're a CTE student, you know, or and, and just reframing that constantly so they kind of uh, embrace them as their student um, and we will I, it might start within our own program I know my we have a college to career program at our campus and and they are out there building the relationships and the students are out there building the relationships and so it's it's everybody um, kind of just changing their perspective showing that the students first of all are capable but really it's um, keep going back to no this is a CTE student and who happens to have a disability possibly but um, I, I think it has to start within maybe within us, but it is really just about building relationships because we, uh, one example, we had an, a, a meeting with the automotive program and, and they were kind of wanting two of our students not to be a part of the program. Um, just, they said concerns about safety and, and so rather than just allowing them to say, no, they can't be in, we all sat down and talked and, and. The more they, you know, got to, we all talked, they were really loving the students. They really, really wanted them. And so then we just brainstormed, well, okay, if this class maybe isn't the best, it was an electronic class of some type, and there might be a safety concern, what else? And then we saw the wheels turning on them, and they started, wait, we should, let's funnel them here, and can we do this? And they're checking the schedule and trying to find other classes. So I think it is just the sitting down and talking, but building the relationship. Um, I have a couple of questions. Denise, do you want, people want to know what is CTE? Yeah. Yes, um, actually Greg and I only answered the first question, so we're, we're happy to fill in as we get through. But um, CTE is Career Technical Education, and what part of this will do is, you know, with the Student Success Act, a part of it is, you know, moving students on through to get their AA degree with a kind of more narrow um, focus. Um, but the the benefit, in my opinion, is going to be that another way of success, another avenue of success, is career technical education certificates. 
And so the one thing we want to push is stackable certificates. If students can go and if, I mean, if, if the colleges and, and non-credit programs will create stackable certificates, our students can obtain some of the certificates. They can earn maybe one or two. Maybe they're not going to be at the very top of the Toyota 10 program and operating, um, running a Toyota shop. But I don't know that that's the goal for our students. But they can do some of the entry level certificates. And so that's what we're really pushing. Um, we're hoping to have um, more other funding sources. And Greg and I will be talking about AB 86 at our table talk. And that's another avenue for non credit to be able to create some more certificates. And that's one area that we're pushing, just more options and finding out, you know, first of all, what our students want and then creating those. Stormy, another question that I heard out here was, Taylor Day Service, is that an agency or is that a service? Someone wanted to know, do they apply to that agency? So if you could clarify what it is. Sure, um, it is a service. Um, I, and I've mentioned this oftentimes in San Diego, um, let's not think of it as a program. Now it is um, day programs or employment programs that are able to implement the service and, and have in our area, um, but it is very different from uh, the traditional day program. Um, so typically what you see um, is the service allows for uh, more flexibility in the schedule, really individualizing what the activities um, are going to be, what's the purpose, and you do that through the planning team process, through the IPP. Um, so it's it's that individual who's really driving the um, services um, based on what it is that they're trying to accomplish, whether that be um, moving in the direction of starting their business or going to school and really outlining those supports. Um, so it is not um, an agency, although it is um, it, it is a, a service provider, an agency who is um, it, delivering the service. So I should mention that I don't know that every regional center, the 21 regional centers, that every um, one has this in their area. In San Diego, we have 11. Um, in your area, it may be one or two agencies that have the service. Um, but if it is something that you're wanting to um, know more about and are interested in, then you really should be having that conversation with your regional center because it is a possibility to explore the, 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 the service. Did that answer the question? Okay. Okay, well that is unfortunately right on time. So we, we get extra credit for being on time. Um, um, so, Thank you to all the members of the panel, and they will be, most of them, you're all going to be here eating lunch, right? And so you'll be at some of the tables, and you can ask them all the questions that you are holding back on now. So thank you very much.